Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax Pets here, and today I'll be giving you an update on my Desert Tenebrionid or Darkling Beetle Vivarium. Well, this just came in from Beast Pets and Supplies, also known as U.S. Invertebrate. This is specifically Asbolus substrate. Asbolus referring to the genus in which blue death fanning beetles and their close relatives fall. And this is kind of similar to what I've done in the past where I make sure there's organic material underneath, but this is specifically created for the death fanning beetles. Let's see. I was looking at these and it took a minute to figure it out because it talks about a top layer of one inch and a two inch bottom layer. But then I looked in the bag and you can see there's a separate bag inside. So let's take a look at that. So this is the top layer. And because I'm doing a 20 gallon long, I'm using four of these bags. So each one of these bags contained one of these bags. So unfortunately, when I shot this sequence here, I thought I was shooting it in time lapse, but I wasn't. So we'll give you an edited version. So now that we have the two layer substrates in from US Invertebrate, I'm going to put in the decor. And this is all decor that I had in the previous iteration of the enclosure. Um, you may be familiar with it if you've seen it in another one of my videos. The decor that you see me adding to the vivarium right now consists mostly of choya wood and sagebrush wood. It serves several purposes. Hopefully, it's aesthetically appealing to human observers, but more importantly, provides hides for the beetles, as well as lots of surface area upon which they can climb. I'm trying to arrange it as closely as possible to the original configuration that I had in the vivarium in its previous form. The substrate's a little deeper, so I'll probably have to make a few modifications. But I think it's starting to shape up pretty nicely. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. And here is my crew of desert tenebrionid beetles, or darkling beetles. You can see there are various Asbolus verrucosus, the blue death fanning beetle. Right here. Front and center is the Asbolus lavis, the smooth death fanning beetle, closely related. We have the ironclad beetle right here. This is uh, Cryptoglossus muricata, the rough death fanning beetle. And, and we've got a few more. There's some a pair of Eliotis armata in here. one or two more species. So, without further ado, let's bring them over to their new digs. Okay, and I'm going to move these over with a nitrile glove. I don't fear the beetles doing me any damage, but I do uh, want to avoid getting repugnatorial fluid on me for the species that can do that. Not many of these will, but some can. Here comes another blue death painting beetle. I think I'll start with that species first. They look really nice against this, this red sand. And I'm colorblind, but I can still see how it sets them off pretty nicely. Only partially colorblind, technically color deficient. Here is a little wee one. And before I release any more beetles into the new enclosure, I'd like to take a second to thank my patrons at Patreon. I really appreciate all that you do. And in recognition of that, I put the names of all of my patrons in some of my videos. You'll find that list of patrons at the end of this video. If you'd like to find out more about what it means to be a patron for Aquarimax Pets and help support this channel, then please check out the link at the end of this video or in the description. And now let's do some more. I can see one, two, three, four, 
five. I put five blue death veining beetles in now. There's number six. They're all over this paper towel I used when I put them into the holding deli cup here. Uh, and they're all over it. That's seven, I believe. There's number eight. Another good reason to use this uh, glove is that I think it helps uh, reduce the amount of, um, how can I say, the amount of skin oils that you get on the beetle, uh, which can cause their their blue coloring to kind of fade temporarily. It, it comes back, but uh, it's kind of annoying. Uh, and I don't know that it causes discomfort for, to the beetle. It probably doesn't, but aesthetically it's not very pleasing to see that get rubbed off. And so this glove seems to help avoid that. Now here is a little tiny one. I can't recall the species name right now. This is one of my favorites. Good things come in small packages. Um, it's kind of off camera there, but it looks like it's going to turn around. This one was sent to me by... Peter and Jesse at Bugs in Cyberspace. I believe it's been well over a year now. That little guy's still going strong. Um, that was for a an expo. And I asked for a, a package of beetles, um, some more beetles to, to liven up this enclosure. Part of the reason I had a shallow substrate in here before is because um, it was for presentation purposes. I needed something I could easily carry, and you can't carry container like this very easily when there's three inches of substrate in it. And so I've had very shallow substrate in there since that expo. But uh, now I'm just kind of going to kind of refocus the purpose of this enclosure and see if we can get more larvae out of it. Here is the diabolical ironclad beetle. That was also in the, in the package from Bugs in Cyberspace. These beetles come from various sources. Some come from U.S. invertebrate, some come from bugs in cyberspace, some come from people who contacted me and said, hey, I, I have a couple of blue death hanging beetles and I'd like to adopt them out to you um, and send them to me, you know, various, various sources. So, and some of these may well be some of the ones that I produced myself. I only produced a couple before changing focus and not really focusing on breeding these. I haven't tried to incubate larvae or anything for a while now since my last video on surface pupation, I think I had a successful surface pupation of one of the beetles. Worked out just fine. A little help from Invertebrate Dude, I believe it was, who told me to put some, a piece of uh, cork bark near it so it could grab onto something um, and not remain upside down too long so it didn't get dense in its elytrae, which I appreciate uh, very much. So we've got some Lots of beetles feign death, not just the ones that are actually named death feigners. As you can see, the diabolical ironclad beetle, very convincingly looking dead. The Eliodes armata right here, also some of my favorites, don't seem to play dead, but they really do um, stick their abdomens up in the air when they are attempting to ward off potential predators. I am really excited to have played a small part in getting uh, blue death feigning beetles more widely bred in captivity. Um, I didn't crack the code, that was Dean Ryder, and I wasn't the first person to do it, but I was the first person to widely publicize the method, I guess, and um, share my results uh, on a YouTube video about doing that. And if you want to check out my playlist on that whole process, you can do that right up here. I want to thank uh, U.S. Invertebrate for sending this substrate to try out. I wanted to mention that um, they are trying some interesting things out. They have successfully had F2s, in other words, the second generation of captive bred blue death fanning beetles. Uh, and quite a few of them from what I understand. And part of it has to do with, you know, this double layer substrate, which helps to provide a nutritious layer for the, the larvae. And part of it, they attribute part of their success to um, what they're using for food because we know that these beetles subsist largely on, uh, they're omnivorous, but they subsist largely on insect 
uh, remains. They, they scavenge for dead insects and, and things like that. And that is a large part of their diet, more than 60% of their diet. And so one thing that U.S. invertebrate is doing is trying to replicate that diet more closely. Um, they are providing a lot of um, insect material as the dietary uh, source. Make sure they get plenty of protein and, and the other nutrients from that. And not just dried insects, but fresh, freshly killed insects can provide um, hydration as well. So they, they also do that. And they're avoiding um, some of the higher sugar foods in the diet that they're providing. Um, things like uh, fruits and so on. Because in the wild, these uh, beetles do not seem to eat a lot of that. And while they can definitely eat it, and they will eat it, um, U.S. invertebrates are suggesting that maybe the best diet is one that avoids such things and focuses more on what they would find naturally. And that makes some sense. So I'm going to try to uh, more closely re replicate their diet. Of course, if you look at my really old videos, you've seen that I've been feeding them things like crickets and so on for a really long time, dried shrimp, that sort of thing. I've been doing that. But uh, I've also been feeding some other things. And not to say that they can't breed successfully if they uh, get things like carrots and whatnot. Dean Ryder bred his mainly on a diet of dried crickets and carrots. Um, Stephanie contacted me, and she has successfully produced a lot of beetles. Here are some of the first beetles she produced. But here is a photo of uh, her beetles. And I don't remember exactly when she sent me this photo. So she's probably, it's been a while, and she's probably produced a lot of beetles since. But um, these are raised mainly on dried crickets and um, organic matchstick carrots and the dried oak leaves that she puts in there in the substrate. And that's basically what they get, and obviously it's working for her. So there's more than one way to do this. The beetles are pretty adaptable, but it does totally make sense to try to replicate their natural habitat um, to a large extent and their natural diet and so on to help make for healthier, more successful beetles and more successful breeding. So we'll see what happens. Um, in this setup, I'm hoping to see some more larvae. And I recently did a test of my incubator and apparently in my well-insulated garage, I can maintain a temperature in the mid-80s even in the winter in my incubator. So I am looking forward to lengthening the seasons uh, during which I can produce uh, beetles by collecting larvae from this enclosure and moving them on over. So thank you to U.S. Invertebrate for sending me this substrate. Thank you to Stephanie for allowing me to share these pictures of the her captive bred beetles with you. Um, and thank you all for watching. I post videos every Friday with live streams on Wednesdays, all on aquarium and vivarium pets. Please feel free to share, rate, comment. If you haven't already, subscribe. And then tap the bell for all notifications so you don't miss my next video. Even the most accomplished death fainter of all is starting to show signs of life. Excuse me. Pardon me. Excuse me. Oh, oh, terribly sorry. I'm not dead. I want to go for a walk. I feel happy. I feel happy.